Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, before we get going, going, uh, I have been wanting to come to Tyler for 35 years. <laughs> Only a couple of you know this, but um, when I was younger, as many, when many of you were younger, uh, I had a form of identification that was not authorized by the state where I was supposed to drive. And that form, of, that form of identification showed that I was 21 years old. And my address for my fake ID from a kid from Alabama was a place called Tyler, Texas. <laughs> so I'm happy to be here, happy to see my hometown and a lot of my friends. <laughs> Okay, um, I have a pretty tall task uh, this morning, and uh, I hope that we go along on a ride together on this topic. I feel like it's super important. Um, Michael Stanbo um, asked me to do this, and it was based off of a talk that I had given um, on part of this, what I told him was seven different times. And he goes, no, it's really good and it's perfect for this audience. And I was like, I can't give it again because I'm gonna look out in the audience and see someone, uh-oh, I see someone right now who's seen this talk and then I'll feel guilty for the, everybody else for the remainder of the, of the 45 minutes. So I've modified this quite a bit and I'm, I hope this is a, a good story for you. Um, but my charge this morning is to basically build this, to, to uh, plead with you as managers and scientists to help build the science for oaks, oak ecosystems, and fire, and specifically prescribed fire. Before I do that, it is also my job to remind you um, there's a little sheet sitting on the entrance table that has some small font um, that says something about a special collection of papers in the journal Fire Ecology. Um, Lauren Powell Knapp. Um, Mike and I, Michael and I are uh, co-editing this. Um, we did this for the Tuscaloosa meeting. We also did this for the State College meeting. Um, and it's been a really successful, nice marriage between the journal, Fire Ecology, and this conference. Um, and I would encourage you, um, beyond those who are gonna submit some standard paper, if you look at the at this list, if you can squint and see it, it's kind of hard to see, isn't it? But there's a little, if you look at the page up front, it'll have the types of contributions and some of those are uh, outside the box. They are very different. So some sort of conversation about um, successful treatments in some landscapes where in many ecosystems that would be so super passe, super colloquial, we don't need that sort of information, but in a lot of oak ecosystems, those sorts of case studies are tremendous. They're, they're major leaps, and so uh, please don't be dissuaded from uh, submitting to it. The, there's some deadlines on that form. Um, it's not tomorrow. Papers aren't due until December, which sounds like a long way away, so please consider that. Okay. Um, so this is what I'm going to talk about today, um, and I hope that these are the three points that you come away with. Um, one, that there's a pretty long legacy of overlooking fire in oak ecosystems in the eastern U.S. Um, it may be that in the spot where you are, that is not as true, but I think as you move around the really diverse oak dominated or oak co-dominated ecosystems of the eastern U.S., you see clearly that um, there's a lot of debate. Uh, when the Joint Fire Science Program about 10 years ago was doing um, major science needs in the U.S. and they were management needs for science, um, the comment was made that the biggest issue in the United, in, in U.S. fire was not about wildfire in the West, it was about what to do with eastern deciduous forest because the controversy was so great. Um, I like to think that's still the case, um, but I do, I do think that puts it in perspective. Um, the talk that I have given that I'll weave into this is this is a discussion on the science of prescribed fire. Um, similarly overlooked for a long time, um, and I think a lot of us, whether you're a practitioner or a scientist, take it for granted that um, you know, sometimes you'll say, well, we just don't know a lot about that, or we borrow this decision support tool and we modify it in a way so it works for prescribed fire. If that were any other field, if you were a pilot and you were in a flight simulator and you're like, well, it's not a helicopter, but let's use the airplane 
flight simulator and just trick it a little bit to think it's a helicopter. That'd be completely inadequate. We'd think that would be ridiculous, but somehow for prescribed fire, we think it's okay. So I wanna make that case for you. And then I wanna to come to um, what are the real needs? And you can't, no one can give a talk that are what are the real needs without showing their bias. So I'm a plant person. So it'll be plant focused. Um, and I have some, my own research areas that I'll also be focused on. Um, it doesn't mean that this is an, ex you know, an exhaustive list. It just means these are some major needs, which I think also underscores just how bad the situation is that you're gonna have some things where you raise your hand at the end and say, what about so-and-so? And I'll go, add it to the list. Of course, add it to the list. Okay. Um, oaks and fire, overlooked. Um, this is the way we started a paper that came from, it was the introductory paper for the special issue uh, from the Tuscaloosa Conference. Uh, a few people in the room were co-authors on this. This is the very first paragraph. And for those, uh, we've already seen a picture of Lucy Braun, who is a, a deity in uh, Oak Forest um, understanding. You notice this quote here in the middle, or this, this line in the middle. In Braun's 1950 classic, Deciduous Forests of Eastern North America, she devote, devoted fewer than 20 of its 596 pages to fire. And for those who've read that book, um, it, it, the notations to fire are often following this logging operation, the slash was burned. And that is the re reference to fire. It is not how fire was weaved in the management of existing stands, how seedlings responded to fire. It's none of that sort of stuff. It is fire as a damaging agent. Certainly that was the, the feeling of the time, um, but to have something that we all see as the fundamental book in our understanding of these systems um, is really depressing. We went on to um, analyze 11 years of the journal Fire Ecology, um, and we found over those 11 years, 11 papers had been published on the Eastern Deciduous Forest, about 6% of everything they had published. So a dominant ecosystem where a bunch of us are working, a lot of management is happening, a lot of prescribed fire is happening, and barely even mentioned in the literature. So I think those are nice, both contemporary and, um, and a little bit dated, just showing how little uh, we focused on oaks and, and fire. Um, but these landscapes are there, and these, um, these little cutouts of, uh, of folks burning are all over the landscape. We saw it yesterday. Um, wherever you work, you know that this is a dominant process. And so it's not a, it's not a trivial situation that we don't know very much about how uh, oak ecosystems and fire interact. It actually is a, it's a pretty major issue. Um, we never want to have it where, uh, as, a, as an applied scientist, I never want to have it where managers are operating blind or operating on rules of thumb or uh, some experience. Some experience is great until you're sitting at the, um, and the judge is saying, no, you need to answer the question. And someone says, cross-examine. That's not a great, um, a great time to figure out that we don't have a very good science base. And I think it, it matters beyond that. Um, I mentioned that comment from the Joint Fire Science Program director, um, but a few of us came together um, several years ago when a paper was published that called into question the use of prescribed fire in, uh, in eastern deciduous forests. And um, it was pretty damning. Um, some of the issues we know uh, that we all deal with, um, non-native species are, was certainly a major part of this. And I think many of us who've dealt with non-native understory plants know that um, particularly those that do well following fire or other, other uh, restoration or management treatments know that it's a big issue. But this paper wasn't in, a, in some throwaway, um, you know, uh, trash journal. It was in conservation biology, a major journal in our field. Um, and it got a lot of attention. And a lot of people can use this against a lot of activities that you do on the landscape. So the, a group of us, again, some of the people in this room, got together and did a clapback um, where we commented on it. Um, but it really, what that, the clapback did was, it showed us that we didn't have a huge amount of support for some of the things that we wanted to clap back on. 
it was a real nice wake up call to people who, if you do the math on the number of years these people had been working in these ecosystems, um, it's a little bit embarrassing that we don't know more. And so it was a good time for us to start to put our heads together to say, here's a little bit of a research agenda, let's start to move forward in this, on this agenda to help solve some of these issues. Because um, you can't imagine a, a paper like this, a reassessment of the use of fire as a management tool in longleaf pine ecosystems. That'd be laughed out of the building. It would be a desk rejection. Um, same thing for ponderosa pine or other systems where fires historically were about as frequent as, um, as fires in, in many eastern oak ecosystems. So it's a huge issue and us, gen the scientists generating um, a better understanding is really important and doing it in actionable fashion. So we're not just generating science for science sake, we're generating it so that it has, uh, it has action or applicability on the, on the ground. Okay, um, many of you have seen maps that look like this. Um, the map on the left is the National Prescribed Fire Use Survey. It varies a little bit annually, but tends to look like this. Um, the darkest colors on that left map are the most prescribed fire use. Um, and the map on the right, you've seen some version of that. That is Quercus, the distribution of Quercus and Quercus diversity. You can see the bluer colors are more diverse. Um, and if we zoom in a little bit, and we, I did this. This is pretty fancy um, cartography work on my own here. Uh, I can't tell you the secrets I use, but if you plot the, the top six states here, um, you see that there's a lot of oak diversity in those landscapes and basically all the top six states are sitting there. If we extended it to 10 states, they'd still be sitting in the eastern U.S. And they're sitting in areas where um, oak diversity is really high um, and, and a lot of prescribed fire is used. Interestingly, this map is, as you know, the, those hot blue areas of southwest Alabama are not upland oak ecosystems, they're pretty mixed, and a lot of those southeastern coastal plain sites are pine systems with oaks, and what do we do in those systems? What's the dominant management paradigm? Kill oaks. Um, so I think it brings up a lot of, a lot of uh, aspects that are, that are relevant to our conversations about how we understand fire and oaks. I mentioned there was a talk that I gave. I started giving the talk on this topic, prescribed fire science and the need for it um, about seven years ago and about three years ago, we finally got together a group of people and wrote a paper on it. Um, and it, it was, um, just as oaks have been overlooked, it was looking at how prescribed fire has been overlooked. Um, so now I will try to weave these things together, um, but also put this prescribed fire story in perspective in case you don't believe me. Um, we know that prescribed fire does all these great things. Uh, yay, uh, prescribed fire. Uh, Tall Timbers is my organization is built on prescribed fire. We like to consider ourselves the home of modern prescribed fire. Um, and we're working on all these things from a research and policy standpoint and from a, a management on the ground standpoint. Um, but that last little tiny font at the bottom, uh, from a science perspective, prescribed fire, as I mentioned earlier, often gets lumped with wildfires. And if we look at that as this umbrella of all wildland fire, where we have wildfires and prescribed fires, if I told you that annual extent of prescribed fires, six years in 10, exceeds annual extent of wildfires, would you be surprised? I'm always surprised by it. Um, because my news, my inbox, my phone is blowing up for about six months of the year. Uh, please fly to so-and-so and talk to folks about this because this is, these massive wildfires are occurring. Um, and the subtle, periodic, often really focused on a, on a really narrow window work that's happening uh, doesn't get any of that sort of attention unless one escapes. Um, but this is, these are the general averages, again, six in 10 years prescribed fire extent exceeds wildfires. And so just like with oaks and fire in the literature, prescribed fire gets short shrift. Um, from a funding standpoint, $3 to $1. Um, from the Joint Fire Science Program, $3 goes to focus on wildfire, $1 goes to prescribed fire, even though, again, they're equal or prescribed fire is greater in extent. Uh, the journal Fire Ecology that I love so much 
half, 50% more of their articles are focused on wildfire topics than they're on prescribed fire, which should be the opposite of what you'd expect because if I'm doing an experiment, I wanna be able to say, here was my treatment. Here's how I measured that fire behavior. It is very difficult for me to do that on a million acre wildfire that is varying every day, that has engines moving here, it has aerial attack, it has all sorts of stuff happening. It's, a, it's N equals one, it's a terrible way to do a research project. But instead, wildfire gets more, more pages. Um, the International Journal of Wildland Fire has a three to one ratio focused again on, on, uh, on wildfire. So even though we're equal to or greater, dismissed. Um, and they're different. Wildfire and prescribed fire are different. I think this is pretty obvious, but I like to go through them anyway. Um, they're different in a lot of ways. And what I'm gonna do is focus on four of these specific to oak ecosystems. Um, but each of these is very different. Um, and I hope that you, you come away with um, not only buying that, but also going a little bit farther. So let me go through a few of these. I'll touch on some quickly, and then others I'll go in greater detail. Um, obviously there's pretty big fire behavior differences. I think every, anyone who's participated in a prescribed fire or ever seen one knows that there are great differences. Uh, these burns on the right, any guess, prescribed fire or wildfire? Yes, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, prescribed fires have pretty intentional uh, ignitions. Um, there is a tremendous amount of interaction between fire lines. Um, for those of us who model fire behavior, uh, use it in the management context, um, you are initiating either a point or some line on a landscape and that fire is spreading. That fire is spreading like a wildfire. The focus on rate of spread, which is uh, an overwhelming focus of, of uh, fire behavior models, is irrelevant in a prescribed fire setting. What's the rate of spread? Uh, oops, let's not do that. That was scary. Okay, uh, what's the rate of spread on the, the bottom right image? It doesn't matter. And it wouldn't matter anyway to the species that are there. How about the rate of spread in this very tight uh, strip head fire that they're igniting in that ponderosa pine in the Southern Cascades? Again, irrelevant. Um, the intensity matters in those systems, but the rate of spread, something that is the overwhelming focus of those models, um, is, uh, is really irrelevant, or at least is a, is a very low importance. Um, you can see these other things, and I think you know the bottom one to me speaks the loudest, that prescribed fires tend to be ignited under most, most marginal conditions, um, and wildfires tend to be burning at the other end of that extreme. Not always, certainly there's overlap, um, but if you're looking at fire behavior and thinking about a fire heating up an adjacent fuel, boiling off the water of the adjacent fuel, and you're talking about that from a really, really wet, at the wet end of a prescription versus a burn ban is in effect, it's really, really dry. Those are two very fundamentally different uh, processes. Um, and so there's, beyond that sort of we need to know, it has relevance, um, which is the bigger issue, not just that it's a science need that we need to figure out. Um, it also has relevance for escapes uh, and for spotting. Uh, two things that really dominate and um, are a very difficult issue for the prescribed fire community. Uh, it has issues for firefighter safety. Um, I think it's pretty obvious. Uh, we use a flight simulator for a plane. You don't crash a plane and go, whew, we learned about that one. Let's do an after action review on how that crash went. No one does that. Um, you use a flight simulator and you go, okay, we, we wrecked again, here's what happened. Let's learn from our mistakes and next time you won't do that, you, you build this expertise. And from a prescribed fire standpoint, we do that. We say an after action review, it escaped. It kept escaping in that one spot. We had that spotting going on. We should have done something ahead of time. Here's what happened. Um, you know, we often have blue ribbon panels that come in after. And that's not a great way to, uh, to provide for firefighter safety or to support our field. And from my standpoint, I, my day job is to work on uh, how trees are killed or survive fire. And uh, prescribed fires are very fundamentally different, uh, particularly because ignition, is so, ignition pattern is so important. Um, and it's very difficult for us to be able to study and to be able to give you results that are, that are powerful. The fuels are different. Um, and when I say that, I don't mean that 
the vegetation, living or dead, is different in the woods uh, from a wildfire to a prescribed fire, but it's the way we think about it. Because prescribed fires have a prescription that has fuel moisture in it and needs to understand the loading of the fuels from a fire behavior standpoint, and also from a, a potential emissions standpoint, we need to have a pretty fine scale understanding of the fuels. Um, and that's a very different way than us thinking about a 300,000 acre wildfire. Um, I noticed yesterday as we were all talking about the different oaks that were out, um, there were a lot of folks saying that that is the biggest blue jack oak I've ever seen in my life. Um, the regional nuance for fuels is overwhelming. Just the sites yesterday that we saw in the morning until the afternoon, those fuel beds are completely different. Um, and I think those sorts of things are, you know, if we're looking at a simple fuel model, they're all lumped in the same fuel model. Maybe they're two. Maybe it's three in the new system, but that nuance actually matters quite a bit, as you know, from an um, ignition and fire behavior standpoint. And we also know that an oak is not an oak. Um, I think this room is, is a pretty easy room to talk about that with. In the southeastern coastal plain, that is a pretty somewhat controversial topic. Um, if you say something about oaks, uh, folks sometimes can put them in two categories. I won't use the term they use for one of them, but then the other ones are the fire adapted or pyrophilic oaks, and the other ones are something else. Um, but oaks vary tremendously. Um, you know they do genetically um, in the different um, clades, and they show tremendous variation in the way they burn. Um, and that's the kind of stuff you, you know, experienced fire managers will have a conversation arguing about whether turkey oak is flammable or not. Um, and we know from a lot of long research that um, they're very different in how they burn, and they're very different in how they dry, which gets them to the spot where they ignite. Um, the East is also somewhat different in that, um, depending on who you talk to, the dominant in the East, or a tree that was pretty common, um, but pretty big sometimes, but not always, uh, is missing. Um, and we know that uh, American chestnut, in all the work we've done looking at flammability of species in the United States, the number one or the number two most flammable species we've ever burned, and that is including ponderosa pine, longleaf pine, you, you say the species, we've burned it. Number one or number two, depending on how you count it, is American chestnut. So we lost this massive this species with a tremendous range, this map here. I promised I would not use a PC2FM map, and here's one that's modified. Um, and if you can see, there's a very faint outline here for American chestnut's range. And at the bottom, um, Mike clipped the range using PC2FM and came up with a historic fire regime for um, for American chestnut. You can see that in that little tiny there at the bottom. The range was from four years to 307 years. And the median fire turnover was about a dozen years. We think that American chestnut probably could have done that. What in the world was, were those forests like with, or woodlands like with uh, American chestnut there? That's a hard thing for us to figure out and try to piece together what in the world was the impact of the loss of that species on, on fire in these ecosystems. Okay. All right, and what I think we're all here to talk about is, um, is how, is the fire ecology, the fire effects. Um, for prescribed fire, we almost always, depending on the, your, your boss or a landowner, uh, a primary objective or the primary objective is ecological. Reduce X species by 50%. Have below 10% mortality of species Y. Um, those sorts of ecological outcomes are not a, oh yeah, and by the way, they're fundamental. That's why you're using fire in the first place. It's not because you want to put fire back in this place. It's because you're trying to meet some objective. All of us are objective-driven fields. Um, and so ecolo the fire effects or fire ecology matters quite a bit. It matters disproportionately in these landscapes and it matters disproportionately in oak ecosystems. Um, and that was a lot of what we both saw yesterday in the field and we talked about on Tuesday here in this room. Um, and we'll talk about later today. Um, it was interesting, yesterday we had in the last stop, at least for whatever group I was in, uh, I think I was B, but I was masquerading as an A. Um, there were a lot of questions that Dwayne Elmore was getting about burn unit size. 
And it's a complicated answer. Um, because in, with fire effects from prescribed fire, patchiness matters a lot. Uh, if you look at a footprint of a wildfire, you tend to be looking at a place of shades of gray that are uh, complete consumption to still a lot of consumption. Very rarely do you have uh, post-fire refugia. It's a whole study topic in the West right now to look at refugia because they're that rare and they're completely overlooked because Maybe they don't matter if you have a million acres and you've got a little stringer of something that remains. Um, they're really, really rare. And in eastern ecosystems where uh, we don't have fundamental dry seasons, um, we get dry periods. And you know where I live in Tallahassee, Florida, two weeks without rain and everyone's talking about it. This is a terrible drought. Um, I lived in northern California where every year was a six-month drought. That's just the Mediterranean pattern. And so a two-week drought is laughable. Um, and that, but what those dry periods and wet periods that are punctuated by lots of precipitation tend to generate patchiness in prescribed fire. And those patches are often where fire-sensitive species hang out or species that are pretty fire-tolerant but probably can't take a fire that's that frequent will hang out and make it through and during the next fire. Um, and I think one of the... One of the um, the words used or sometimes skipped over because I didn't want to say the word, the S word, scale, came up throughout yesterday, throughout um, uh, day one, and it'll come up, I know, in the next, in the next uh, period, it'll be scale, scale, scale. Um, because with prescribed fire, you are determining the size, the shape, the season, the, when it is in the day, all these factors, we have the ability to control scale. And a lot of the results that we read, and perhaps posters here or in the talks or the way we talk about issues, um, are super scale dependent. And um, you know, I think the frustration over um, you know, research that shows something and you scratch your head and say, we don't have that issue at all. I don't understand how in the world they found that because they have a very small exclosure. Um, in a landscape where they've treated five acres of, a, of many thousands of acres, um, and if you had treated thousands of acres in a landscape of thousands of acres, you may have gotten a completely different result. And so that scale issue, as we restore these ecosystems, becomes really, really important. And I think it's a good thing if you're playing a drinking game at home, every time scale comes up, that'd be the word. You don't want to pick scale uh, because we'd all be pretty intoxicated. <laughs> Okay, so if we go through the fire effects needs specifically, and I'll go through a, a handful of these that I think, again, showing my bias, I think are major needs. Um, one of those is oak mortality. And um, I am a, a, a co-PI on this project called the Fire and Tree Mortality Database. It's a Forest Service uh, collaborative with USGS and Tall Timbers, um, and now University of Montana where we have been collecting post-fire tree mortality data from around the U.S. We've been doing it for about eight years. Uh, we built this tremendous data set, hundreds of thousands of trees, uh, 142 species, um, and we're trying to make it where um, we build a better uh, tree mortality prediction model. Uh, the models that are used in FOFM, the first order fire effects model, that is the engine for uh, FES, the Forest Vegetation Simulator, Fire and Fuels Extension, um, et cetera, et cetera. Behave Plus is now modifying to build a real tree mortality equation. All of those are built on this, these fundamental tree mortality equations. And they look like something like this, if you can see this. Um, so we've built these for 142 species. Uh, if you squint here, this is ponderosa pine. You can see the distribution of little dots here over its natural range. You see that? Uh, those are where post-fire tree mortality studies have taken place. That's awesome. Um, if you see here, zoom in, and I pull my glasses down, it's got 38,000 trees in that data set. That's awesome. A tree mortality person, when trees rarely die, you need a big number, and 38,000 is a really, really big number. Um, you can see it's, it covers basically all the distribution in the western U.S. of ponderosa pine. This over here is a climate envelope, and the orange dots are where studies have taken place, the black is the cloud of where ponderosa pine occurs. Look at that, it looks great. It looks pretty well covered. I mean, you could have some hotter sites out there on the right. We could, we're doing that right now. We'll add some more sites. Maybe we'll have 39,000 next year, that'll be great. 
Um, and what I really want you to look at is these two graphs here, particularly this one on the left. This is the, the line on the left, the orange line is the prediction based on the model for tree mortality. And that primary predictor as it is for every single species in the 142 species we've studied is crown volume scorched. Crown scorched, primary predictor. It always is. As much as I'd like to say, well, there are other factors that drive mortality, they're freak occurrences, uh, they're not primary drivers. And you look here at crown volume scorch and then those gray dots there are the observed, you can't tell them apart because the model overlaps observation. Yes, Woo. go Forest Service, Tall Timbers, USGS, way to go, nailed it, feels so good. And then you look on the right here um, and there you have tree size and the probability of mortality and until you get out here to the really, really huge sizes, if you can squint, you'll see that those diameters are about six feet in diameter where it has that weird little split. So if you have trees above six feet in diameter, the model doesn't work very well, I'm sorry. But otherwise, again, the orange dots and the gray completely overlap. It's a perfect, it's a fantastic model. We have these descriptors, it, data quality, excellent. Model performance is excellent. Uh, over predicts rarely, under predicts rarely. Whew, that makes me feel so good. Go Ponderosa Pine. Are you surprised it's the most studied? Tree more, yeah, okay, no one is surprised. You say though, hey, how about Eastern Oaks? Well, um, here's one. <laughs> Chestnut Oak, Quercus Montana, if you, for those who are using uh, modern terminology. Um, you can see the map there, the native range is in green, and those dots, that's right, those dots are uh, two little dots. Um, and if you look at the total number of trees, oh man eyes, 107 trees, not 38,000, but 107. Chestnut oak is a major dominant in eastern deciduous forests. In right? many ecosystems, in many oak ecosystems, it is the dominant. And yet we have 107 trees, and I, don't, I think you can see from where you're sitting, regardless of what the axes are, you can see that these lines never overlap, these lines never overlap. Those models don't work. There should be a disclaimer if you're planning a prescribed fire to predict mortality that says, whoa, before you push that button, these, this model does not work. It actually does not fit observation. Um, that's pretty bad. So maybe I'm stacking the deck a little bit. But let me show you the only other eastern oak in the 142 species, and that is white oak. White oak, sort of a dominant, right? If there's a single oak that's on fire for, is it a chestnut? Oh, it is a chestnut oak in the, in the picture. I should have said that. The, the logo for this conference is a chestnut oak on, in flames, but if you were to say, what is the species that defines eastern oak ecosystems, everybody would say Quercus alba. There are only 100 individuals in this data set. You can see the lines at the bottom, again, don't even overlap, and not only that, they're moving in different directions. If you look at this little thing over here that you may have been squinting to try to see, it shows that the bigger the tree, the greater the mortality. Completely defying the rules of tree mortality unless it's had long periods of fire exclusion. You'd see that the more crown injury, the better survival. It's, this is the worst model ever for this. And it's because we have 100 trees. For a tree mortality study that we're doing, we don't have plots that have 100 trees because it's too small. Because if you lose two or three trees, you need 100 trees to find two or three, right? It's two or three percent mortality. You need 1,000 trees to find that many trees, so you have a robust data set to be able to compare those characteristics. You can look at both of them and see where those studies are taking place. You notice that both of them are from the same site. I think, Helen, I think you probably have measured these. Um, and it, they're totally unrepresentative of what's happening across its range. Those are the only two. There's no blackjack oak a strong model. There's no turkey oak strong model. There's no post oak strong model. How is that possible? Um, and this is where we are with it. And I think this is what you see. Um, I mentioned only two species. The data sets are tiny. There's a tremendous amount of work. The added complication is, anybody have any hiccup when I said something a minute ago? The number one predictor of post fire tree mortality is crown scorch. What's the problem with oaks and crown scorch? A tremendous amount of burning takes place in the dormant period. So our ability to measure where we 
where we have found on 140 something or 130 something species the primary driver we can't measure it because there are no damn leaves in the tree so it it is not only a we need to pick up another species it's we need to think about these species in a very different way on how we estimate how much injury they've sustained that's tough Okay, so let's we acknowledge that um, overstory tree is pretty bad. How about understory? Um, I, I am fine to say this, it's a weak literature base. Long leaf pine ecosystems, it is what we do. Every study, you're gonna hear something about, here's the change in understory plant diversity, here are these functional groups that changed, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I can look across this room and there are about four papers, six papers that have been written on this topic in Eastern Deciduous Forest. Um, and uh, that's a problem because that's often a question. Yesterday, a lot of folks were doing this saying, what's this species here? Oh, what? Oh. I saw the trait of Scantia and thought, oh God, it's a non-native. This place is a disaster. And then I was embarrassed later on when they said, no, this is a endemic. Um, but that understory, the patterns in that, particularly non-natives um, and where, what the trajectory is for a lot of species that have undergone very little study is, is troubling. Um, because I like to do this, this recent book that Frank Gilliam, who is a, a fire ecologist, wrote, um, he edited it, Herbaceous Layer of Forests of Eastern North America. And you can see on the cover, there are a couple of ecosystems that may look familiar. And for me, um, there's a little tiny longleaf pine savanna there. So of course, this understory is gonna be, you know, fire is gonna be discussed like crazy in this book. Well, of the 508 pages, 10 of them have fire on them, 10. That's less than 2%. In longleaf pine ecosystems, it is all about fire. It's 100% about fire. Soil texture, yeah. What about the, some variation in climate? It's about whether fire, when fire occurred, both seasonally and, in, and from a frequency standpoint. The same thing could be said for lots of areas in the eastern, in eastern oak forest. But yet, this is the state of our knowledge. Very little understanding. That's unfortunate, isn't it? So we got overstory trees we know very little about. Two species, you could say, are, are um, well, they're not even done well, so they're terrible. No, no overstory oaks we have good mortality models for. Uh, we have a poor understanding of understory uh, vegetation change, compounded with the high variation in oak ecosystems in the eastern U.S. If I say oak eco ecosystem in the U.S., Joe's thinking of something in, in Missouri. Callie has something in northwest Alabama. I'm thinking of, I mean, I'd call it an oak hickory pine system in North Florida, and each of you have your own system in your head. And now to take that situation and make it uh, where we try to understand better understory and overstory dynamics, you can see what, how tall the order is for us to move forward. And I think that extends to restoration, um, because this is the fundamental question that we all face. And everybody talked about it yesterday. Well, what did you do? When did you, well, how much tank mix? What was the, the questions that you have about restoration treatments basically are which treatments and in what order result in restored oak woodlands and savannas? That's what we all wanna know, right? Every site you visit, like what happened here? How did you get to this? And in your head, you're going, you know what I would've done? I would've done so-and-so. Um, all of us do that regardless of, we, uh, of our hopes. And as we saw yesterday, there were issues about scale, whether it's animals or plants in restoration treatments. They tend to be smaller and somewhat boutique. Um, and yesterday we saw some big treatments and the questions um, and a lot of the comments were, yeah, but we think it's probably small in this landscape and so we worry about scale. I don't have to say anything about this because there's a poster outside and and Dan talked about it on Tuesday, but I know everywhere we go talking about fire outside of um, a couple of Southern Pines, folks say, yeah, but uh, this wood quality issue. Um, and I think there's a, a really nice literature base that's starting to emerge showing, um, you know, what are the drivers and just how bad or how, how um, benign this situation is. Uh, I am continually struck by the increasing focus on ecosystem services broadly uh, on what we do. Um, we were all, many of us trained, and I used to train um, you know, students on talking about understory plants, talking about um, animals, talking about the overstory, uh, and now we're all talking about um, 
you know, yesterday a tremendous conversation about how these ecosystems are or aren't retaining water. Um, it's a huge concern in the southeastern coastal plain. Uh, I am asked almost daily about the C word, carbon, um, and you know, how fire interacts with carbon. Um, this is a huge area that um, is pretty spotty in the literature, what sort of evidence we have, uh, but it clearly is going to be um, a large part of our future. Um, and then I'm also struck by, uh, by this, and I think we were having a conversation um, last night, it was pretty late, about uh, future locations for this meeting. And um, someone said, uh, and I'm not, I'm not spoiling anything, but they said, well, at Tallahassee, that'd be a great spot. And I was like, yeah, it's a little uncomfortable because a lot of people might go, great, this is the meeting we learn how to kill oaks. Um, and that might be a little awkward for people, right? Um, but this spot right here, is this a picture from yesterday? I can't remember. No, actually, that's, uh, that's on tall timbers. That is uh, oak hickory with a little bit of pine, uh, white oak, black oak, post oak, what in the world? Now, these ecosystems are really, really widespread. And I think if I said, you know, name the state, that's Florida, um, where this occurred, each of us might see something like this in a different space. It's got some slope to it because we're in the mountainous area of Florida. Um, but I think those, those questions about oaks as invaders, basically below the fall line, there's a tremendous push to see oaks as invaders versus above the fall line where of course oaks are the dominant. It's not like the fall line is a magical spot where fire couldn't make it over that almost imperceptible ridge um, or that people weren't using fire for many thousands of years above that or lightning wasn't igniting fuels. But I think that's a huge issue um, that we're still wrestling with and it gets at the real variation in um, in oaks across these landscapes. Um, we, this meeting is great. I love that so many people have pointed to like wearing their shirt uh, or taking a photo of their shirt because it shows the variation in where these, where um, this meeting has occurred. It could just be held in Columbia, Missouri every year. That'd be fine, that'd be nice or every three years. But they've done a great job of moving it to different places because each place has a, a place-based story. And um, this whole, you know, thinking about oaks varies across the landscape. In some places, oaks are, mm, in other places, they are, um, you know, people would have get a tattoo of them. So I think this is a, you know, this is a major need in the future to understand um, these place-based stories. I'm conveniently punting because the next session, um, anything about um, animals, it's usually not a good idea to have a forester or plant ecologist talk about animals anyway. Um, and in the last few uh, things that I'll um, discuss that are major needs um, and major differences between wildfire, prescribed fire, and how it fits for oaks, um, you know, go beyond the ecological, or at least they're not primarily ecological. And one of those is um, understanding burn windows. It's a huge issue. It's a huge issue across the country. Um, and if you ask a manager in this, like I'm from Tyler, many of you are from Tyler, you know what, these, what the burn window is here. Um, if they know this in Austin, um, that's great. Um, if they know this in Atlanta, um, that's great. It starts to get at sort of our understanding of what, um, what burn windows are, but they're getting more and more difficult um, for a lot of reasons that I'll briefly touch on. We presented last time at the State College um, conference, uh, for this conference, we presented a, a model for burn window availability for the eastern U.S. You can see it, didn't, it doesn't do uh, Texas very nicely, uh, nor Maine. But what it shows is sort of what a lot of us know, that, that we have a pretty broad eastern, uh, eastern U.S. window that starts in October, that starts to close in March. Yeah, it could be in some spots in September, uh, and it could, it could extend into April and May in other places. Um, but this sort of, these sort of analyses are really exceedingly rare, uh, surprisingly rare, because it is such a big issue. We're trying to do this for the western U.S. right now and trying to wrap up our eastern U.S. one. Um, 
it's super difficult and this becomes more and more important as we start talking about this and this is how I'll, I'll, I'll uh, close this up here in a second um, I am an ecologist and I, f I told my boss that I think I work 50% of my time on policy um, and I, my guess is that several of you find yourself in the same sort of position. Um, for those that are growing up in this field, you, you will see it. For those that are managers, you're affected by it much more. Um, we've always said that prescribed fire is very different because you're act, asking for permission. And most of the um, eastern states have a permit, permission, um, system. Um, and it's great because you know there are all these wonderful things about having a permit system, uh, except that you're having to ask permission, and so we know where a fire occurs, and we know how many acres that fire is, or at least we have a good idea based on what you told us. We can also fly in satellites and tell you that. Um, but it starts to become a pretty big issue because the social political environment is very dynamic um, in a couple ways. One of those is, um, that the EPA is moving to regulate prescribed fire more than they ever have. Um, and if we're restricted on when we burn, then we need to understand our burn windows even better. Not only from a climatological smoke management standpoint, but also from a how will species respond. In quail woods, if I said, we're gonna, we can't burn in the spring anymore, now we need to burn in September, October, um, all the quail people go, oh, I'm very uncomfortable right now. I can't believe you just said that. Um, if we have to shift burning to other periods for other species, you know what those complications are, and this is likely where we're, where we're headed. Um, similarly, um, we're facing serious insurance issues, something I thought never in a million years would I know anything about, but somehow I've become an expert in prescribed fire insurance because it's something that's dominating your worlds, whether you're working for an agency and trying to have something on the side to protect yourself or you're a private practitioner. These things are really defining a lot of what we're able to do in the future and not whether we know if we're gonna kill 2% or 5% of white oak in this stand. So I think this is a, a huge area. Um, these are the things I just talked about, but what I wanna close with is, um, there are some major opportunities from this wildfire science and prescribed fire science standpoint. There's a little overlap area where we all win, but what I like about it is that, um, like yesterday, the conversations were between manager and manager, but also manager and scientist, and that's what this conference does a great job of doing, is, is promoting that dialogue. Um, and I think that's, a, as we move forward to better define and better build the science for prescribed fire in oak ecosystems, that's the way we should do it. It shouldn't be me going away to my little laboratory, moving some litter together and going, oh, here's the number, I'll record this. It should be us working together, understanding manager needs um, and providing actionable science. And with that, I'll close.